I'll give you guys one announcement, which is super, super, super exciting. I'm sitting open on my desktop of my computer. Our first contract with a major brand. Woo! Huge, huge, huge. Uh, so we have a contract that I just got signed by um, Starboard Cruise Services. Um, so that's a Louis Vuitton company. Starboard does all of the shops on board. They do uh, the shopping program and they are chomping at the bit to work with us. So we're so, so, so excited. Uh, the first positions that we're talking about are uh, merchandising positions. So if you guys know anybody that was in the retail space at all, be it photo manager, um, shopping, port and shopping, anything like that, they're looking to have people um, go out and support the ship um, on ship visits. So they will work for the company, will work the rest through the company, um, but then go and um, check on how ships are presenting products against their standards. Um, and so we'll be working um, with the job description and um, start searching through our database and post it. And then just remember, we have three positions open right now. We have our digital content specialist position, which is working for us. Um, I think we have somebody in the pipeline that we're pretty excited about who's a former crew member. Um, and so, but if you know of anybody else right now, this person um, is starting part time. Um, but if you know of anybody else, we're going to be growing constantly, um, which is such a blessing. Uh, the second one is uh, we have this bingo position. So it's an account manager position. It's located in Florida. Um, it's kind of a niche fill for us. Um, but the thing that I will say about this job is this company and the owner is phenomenal. And I always go back to it doesn't matter what you do. It matters who you work for. And um, so the just our interactions with him thus far. Uh, he's such a gentleman. He's such a good leader. And so we're really excited to play somebody with him. And then um, these merchandising positions are coming up. And then we have a couple of big meetings. I think it's next week there's a meeting. And then the following week um, with another cruise line uh, about positions. Right now our contract is in legal. Uh, it should get stamped and signed in the next couple of weeks. Um, but we're, we're moving and shaking people, moving and shaking four months of business and celebrating every single little win. So choo, choo, choo. So let's get to why we're all here today. And you guys, just a reminder, even if you missed a webinar, um, we post everything in our YouTube channel. The Amazing Wilma um, is, has been overseeing that. So we're recording these and then we're putting it out there because we know that we're dealing with global time zones, people all over the world. And um, so we're just so, so grateful for you guys even uh, showing up for whatever part of this you can. Um, so shift to short life, adapting your budget to your new life. There is something funny about me is that me and my husband, actually, we actually love talking about budgeting and money. Um, it's one of those things that we learned and we have figured out that it's a topic that a lot of people don't know a lot about and they avoid it. And it's something that's really easy for us to talk about. So any time that we get a chance to, um, we, we want to make sure that we provide people the tips and tricks that we have learned. Um, and so we thought that this is one of those things that everybody is interested in. So just remember that at Ship to Shore, we're committed to providing you guys with resources and support that you need to succeed. That's why we're so excited about this, this topic. This is looking at you as an individual, how you're well-rounded across every single thing that you do. And I think money is one of those critical, critical things that if you feel like you own it, you can have tremendous success. But if it feels like something hanging over your head constantly, it can, it can be a really scary experience. So we know from transitioning from ship to shore firsthand the challenge that it can be to learning how to manage a budget, learning how to manage your, your money. And um, when we first got off of a ship, my husband couldn't work. He was waiting on his paperwork in the U.S. Uh, we had one job. We lived in this teeny tiny little um, studio apartment in Miami. We um, didn't have any furniture. We literally got off the ship with two suitcases. And um, what do we start doing is we just started learning every single thing that we could about money and how to manage it so that we could have a success long term. So in this webinar, I'm going to talk to you about some strategies that we've used to budget your new life on land and then talk a little bit about some of making the most of your income, avoiding some common budgeting mistakes, 
and then preparing for unexpected expenses. Um, so first and foremost is my um, my infamous book reading. You guys know I'm a big book person. I'm a podcast, I'm a physical book, and I'm an audio book person. I probably read one book a week or listen to a book a week. And I'll even go back and re-listen to those books. So these are some really, really good books. And the thing that I'll caveat is every single one of these books has a different perspective and they're so different. So I believe that it's important that you don't just follow one methodology or one person. You read about everything that's out there and then you find what's the system that you think works for you. Um, so first is Dave Ramsey, Total Money Makeover. So this book provides a step-by-step -step guide for getting out of debt, uh, for building an emergency fund, and for investing in the future. It's a really, really good resource for somebody who you have some credit card debt, you have some loan debt that's out there, and you want it, tackle it head on, and then you want to live this life where you're sticking to a budget and you are um, investing in stable investments. So Dave, um, also his uh, daughter, her name is Rachel Cruz. She's really good. If you could follow either of them, it would definitely be worth it. Some of the stuff he says, I don't agree with 100% because he's a little bit too conservative for me. Um, but I think fundamentally, there's some really good lessons um, from him on his Instagram. I listen to some of the things. He's funny. He's engaging. Um, your money or your life, or well, actually, the Susie Orman one, women and money. So owning the power to control your destiny. Susie Orman, I absolutely adore her. She was the first person that we started following in the finance world. There used to be, this is before the days really of like books on the internet. Um, and Amazon was just barely birthing at that point. It was a book company originally, actually. Um, that Susie used to have a show on Sunday nights, I think it was. And it was a really cool show where people would come on to it and they would ask questions to her and she would give lessons about money. But she has a good book that's called um, Young, Broken, Fabulous. And then this one, in this book, Susie provides practical advice on the strategies for women specifically, but I think anybody can grab it, can do to take control of their financial lives, from investing to saving for retirement and for estate planning. The thing that I like about her is she gives you really practical tools of invest in this thing, invest in this thing, and she builds out for you what that's gonna mean for the long term if you save on the front end. Um, so, and I think that a lot of these financial people right now, they're talking very specifically to women because women typically, so girls, get your acts together. Women typically in relationships or in life, they tend to leave the reins to their male counterpart or, and they go, oh, well, it's handled. And sometimes that doesn't pan out to their benefit. So I always give advice to anyone, you know, any women that are in my life who don't feel like they have their hands around their finances, is that this is something like breathing. You have to understand it. You have to know how much money you have in your, your uh, bank accounts. You have to know what your expenses are. Um, you cannot trust somebody else to handle it for you. It's like when you talk to a, a company, any company that you go into and you go, the, the owner of the company, the CEO of the company goes, oh, well, my, my um, bookkeeper handles that for me. That is like the most dangerous statement any company owner can say, because you can trust somebody with your money, but you need to be the owner of it and you need to understand it. Um, so next one is Your Money, Your Life by Vicki Robin. Actually, I'm like three quarters of the way through this book because somebody randomly recommended it to me. And this book really challenges the traditional view of money as it needs to happiness. And it provides a step-by-step -step guide for achieving financial independence and creating a meaningful life. So this kind of takes money to the next level. And I just um, read another book called Die With Zero that it would, I don't know if they're connected, but the covers of the book look exactly the same. One is yellow and blue and the other one's blue and yellow. Uh, so there might be some connection. Um, but this is, Die With Zero is a little bit more of an extreme version of making sure that you do the right things at the right time in your life and you don't save all of your money in this pile so that at the end of your life when you're you know in your 90s you regret spending it um and then this one really is challenging um the decisions that you make in life around money um so that you can first determine what is it that you want and then layer your money decisions on top of it 
Um, and then the next one is rich dad, poor dad is, um, I'm totally and completely, um, obsessed with rich dad, poor dad. I think this is a fundamental book that every single person on the planet needs to read. Um, it's a, well, I mean, I teach you have a question. No, she was just saying hi. She was just saying hi. Hello. Hello. Um, rich dad, poor dad. Uh, this is a personal finance book that challenges traditional views on money and wealth. It's really, really controversial and it's really thought provoking because it inspires a perspective on, it inspires a perspective. Oh, you read it, Wilhelmina. That's why you're moving and shaking. Go girl. It inspires a perspective on financial education, assets versus liabilities, um, passive income, and the mindset required for financial success. So he, Robert Kawasaki talks about, and follow him on social, he's getting a little bit, um, what is it? He's getting, he has like all these doomsday predictions and things like that about the market crashing and this is gonna happen and you need to put all your money in gold and silver. So he has a little bit of that in him, but fundamentally this book is really, really important because his rich, well, his poor dad is the one, and this kind of shakes up everything that we've been taught. His poor dad says, get an education, get a good job, make sure you have a retirement plan and save, 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 and then die. And rich dad is the one that's going leverage debt, invest, make sure that you are producing and buying assets that produce you a cash flow. Um, so one of the analogies that it gives with that absolutely love is about, uh, I think it was a Ferrari or Porsche, he likes cars. Um, is that he never denies himself anything in life. So he goes, all right, I really want this new Porsche and this new Porsche costs, you know, I don't know, $5,000 a month for this Porsche. So what he does is he goes out and he looks for something that he could buy. He's in real estate for the most part, but it could be a business, it could be real estate, it could be something that he invests in that gives him $5,000 a month. And so he keeps that Porsche for however long the lease is for the Porsche, three years. And then after that, he still has that asset and it wasn't $5,000 thrown in the garbage. And most people today are operating throwing their money in the garbage. Um, so they're buying new fancy cars, new fancy clothes, things that they cannot afford and don't produce them anything. Um, so his perspective is so, so different to Dave Ramsey's, but that's why I go read both of these materials, listen to both of these books to well-round your perspective. Cause you're gonna, it, it's like, choosing a car, or choosing a house, or choosing a partner, how you're going to manage your money is going to be very, very different than your neighbor. So you have to choose what's the right comfort level for you of risk. What's the right level of risk for you as investment? What are the things that you need to know so that you have long-term success for your family? And just keep in mind, all of these are learning. Um, so educate yourself, ask questions. And then when you're not sure, um, start listening to podcasts. Start finding a group of like-minded individuals who like talking about money and are good at that you can learn something from. So there's something really, really powerful to that. Um, so look at these um, books, look at these resources, follow these individuals. If you need any more, please reach out. Um, so let's talk about how this relates to you. So the challenge really after shifts is when, when you're transitioning from a ship career to a land-based career, you're gonna face new financial challenges. And I think the first thing that's really, really important is your humility. It's just being able to say, I don't know what I don't know. You have to adjust to a new income level. Um, you have to deal with a having expenses, legitimate expenses where you're gonna get kicked out of the place that you live if you don't pay those expenses or your light's gonna go off or your water's gonna go off, um, but also managing debt is that as you look at, and I know that I'm speaking from the point of view of an American, um, I know that depending on what country that you're in debt is gonna mean different things. My husband's from Argentina, so a mortgage, buying a home doesn't exist there, you have to pay cash for it. So his strategy um, or someone living in his country is gonna be very different to that of what mine would be. Um, so I'm gonna speak to you a little bit skewed on that side, um, but I really believe that you can still pull things out of this. Um, so I think it's really important to be intentional about your spending habits and we'll talk through creating a budget that works with your income and your expenses. Typically on a ship, you're only having income. You're having very minimal expenses unless you're pers that person that has to go in the um, crew bar line 
and um, you know, give over everything that you just got to the other person. I was on ships in the cash days. I know that doesn't exist anymore, but you guys know what I mean. Um, so the, it's just really looking at how you avoid getting into debt, how you avoid getting into high interest loans or credit cards, because a lot of people that when they get off of ships is that you're gonna, when you don't have a consistent income, you're gonna lean, learn on these, lean on these other methods that really get you into trouble. And that's where resources like Dave Ramsey um, and, well, Dave Ramsey is a big one, but also uh, the Yellow Book, uh, the uh, the Money or Your Life one. She talks a little bit about that, um, that it's important that she talks through the actual strategies of getting out of debt. Um, Dave Ramsey used ones called the Snowball um, Method, and it's very, very interesting, but it because it helps keeping you motivated to pay off any debts that you may have. Um, so the next one is building a budget that works for your new lifestyle. When you're building a budget for your new life, it's important to be very, very realistic about your income and your expenses. And I just sat with somebody, one of our employees last week, and I did this for him, is that uh, he was struggling with how much money he had left over at the end of the month. And I'm like, okay, let's go through this really quickly. And it can be something as simple as this, but doing it, with somebody that's not afraid of money, you're so afraid of it. Generally, people are so afraid to put the numbers onto paper because then it becomes reality. And it's like you're flying a plane with your eyes closed. Um, I don't know how one of the most important things that's in your life, how you operate it without opening your eyes. So your very, very, very first step is start by tracking your expenses and then in the platform that we used, and this platform has been out there for ages, it was called Mint, M-I-N-T dot com, Mint like the herb that you eat. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones that have come out, but Mint, I have found to be a very, very reliable company. When we started with them, gosh, it has to be 15 years ago, is they were an independently owned Silicon Valley um, platform. And um, then QuickBooks actually bought them. QuickBooks is one of the major financial accounting softwares in the US. Um, so basically what Mint does is you create, it's completely free. The way that they make money is they sell ads for credit cards and things like that. So you just have to kind of ignore the ads when you're on the website, is that you go in there and you link all of your bank accounts and all of your credit cards into this platform and then it begins to pull in your information. If you're living in a country where you don't necessarily have digital banking that's integrated with it, you can also do manual entry. Uh, Rachel Cruz, uh, Dave Ramsey's daughter, also has one. I think it's called Simple Money, Money Simple. It's an app. Uh, hers, you have to pay per month. I've used it a couple times, and it's okay. Mint does the same thing for me. Um, but one of the beautiful things about Mint is that Mint will automatically categorize expenses based on knowing where it came from. So it will know that Publix is a grocery store. It will know that Amazon is shopping. It will know that, and you begin to teach it and label things, and then it begins to automatically categorize. That's kind of an easy, easy plug and play. If you have never done a budget before, you can do something as simple as Excel. Just go out there and make sure that you're getting something that first you're listing every single one of your expenses and then you're sitting down say every single sunday night and you're writing down what you spent for the month and this is kind of your way of not having like the jars with the coins in it you get your paycheck and you split it across the jars um this is a way of doing it in a little bit more modern way mint is the extreme of the modernity and um excel would kind of be the middle the jars would be the elementary so make sure that you guys are coming up with a breakdown of what you're spending. So I think that the first thing that in working, I've worked with a lot of people to help them who they've been in masses of debt and they don't know where to start. The first thing is being really, really kind to yourself and just say, okay, what am I spending? Visibility equals accountability. So if you can be able to start to audit what you're spending your money on, say you make a goal over the next 30 days um, without any cutting back or anything like that, just go, where is all my money going? And you just start documenting. If it's in a notebook every single day that you're just writing what you spent every single penny on and then you categorize it at the end of the week. If you use an Excel sheet, if you use something like mint.com, any of these methods work. But first just start getting a baseline. And then the second thing is going, all right, I'm spending this much money on groceries. That seems exorbitant. 
what is the norm and start looking up for what the average is for something like that. And the person that I sat with recently is they said, when we looked at their budget, they had no, no line item for food. And I was like, aren't you eating? And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, of course I am. I said, okay, so how much? And so we started backing into it and he was really paying too much money for food. And uh, so we said, all right, we need to, that's something that you have to address later on, but let's put a reasonable number into your budget and what you should be spending monthly for food. And then you start working towards that. So really, your must have expenses are the ones that come first. So this is things like your um, housing, your food, um, transportation that get you to work. And that should really be the bulk of your budget. And I would probably say, and you'll find different breakdowns. I think that some of the recent things that I've read is that your housing should be 30, 30 to 50% of your income that comes in. Um, depending on where you live, that's going to vary. Um, and then the overall, um, your spending on your necessities should probably be in like the 60 to 70% range of everything that you're bringing in. Um, and again, this is going to depend on what country you're in, how much those individual items are, but that's kind of a good thing. And most people are overspending in those areas, but the overspending is just about not counting the coins, is not having visibility. You you would be shocked at how um, one of the things that my lovely husband and partner um, does is he notices every single time the internet company ups our, our bill. You know, you can go from in the U.S., $40 a month on internet, you blink and it's 200 because something you didn't call and negotiate because something expired. Um, I call every six months when our car insurance renews, I call and talk to them and I called last time and the lady's like, ma'am, you have every single discount that we offer. Like there's no other discounts to get. You have, are you been with us a long time discount? You've had your age discount, your zip code discount. Your da -da -da. She's like, I don't even have any more discounts. And I'm like, okay, can you do anything better? Um, so I think just looking at things like that, because when you can be able to shift your mindset from it being, I don't have enough and I'm worried about making my ends meet to it being a game to going, I can outsmart the system and I'm smart enough that I'm not going to overpay. Uh, one season in our life when we were living in the studio apartment on the mattress that we got for free and moved on the roof of our car. So we put the mattress on the roof of the car. We're driving down Biscayne Boulevard in Miami and this mattress was like flapping in the wind. Um, but this, hey, it was a free mattress and the lady seemed kind of normal. And so we're like, we're like, it works for us. And then we have a hilarious story about our sofa. I didn't want to get rid of the sofa uh, because of the story, uh, but we always went, we couldn't afford a sofa. And so, um, well, we could afford a sofa if we went into debt, um, but we we went to the thrift store, like a secondhand store in Miami, and every time we went, like the sofas were nasty, and I'm like, you got to draw the line somewhere. I'm not buying a nasty sofa, and we lived in a studio, so you were going to use that sofa a lot, and um, so we would go every single week to check on the sofa, so you're bored, Sebastian, you drop me off at work, go to the thrift store, and one of the one day we go in there and there was a brand new sofa had a tag on it still and we're like oh my gosh because it was a saturday it was so busy and um the then we go to pay for the sofa and there's a lady laying on the sofa and she's like trying to decide between two sofas that she's laying on this sofa and laying on that sofa and then um I what did what did we do is that we got the tag off the sofa, ran to the cash register and paid for it before she had gotten off the sofa. Oh, she got so mad. I thought the sofa was going to be cursed because of how angry she was with us. But we were like, we had been waiting for like three months for this sofa. But the story makes you laugh, of course. But really, it's about um, having that determination and not being frivolous with our money. We couldn't be frivolous with our money because we couldn't afford to. Um, so we had to be, and that sofa meant so much to us because we had done so much work to get there. Sure, we could have gone to the furniture and bought furniture store and gone into debt and bought brand new furniture. And I actually did that at one point in my life. Um, but we learned that lesson. We said, okay, moving forward, we're going to wait and do the long game. Um, so 
just making sure that as you look at your budget, especially as you're transitioning and you're looking at buying furniture, or you're looking at doing something that you're first understanding what you're spending your money on. And then, then that's the first, first, first layer. You adjust that spending and then you start working towards it. And then you start looking for the deals. Um, so negotiating any expenses or bills that you have. Um, so man next one is managing debt. Does anybody have questions about budgets or building budgets? Uh, we're going to like, we'll have questions at the end. Um, so guys, feel free to stop me or write something in the comment. And Wilhelmina will stop me if you have any questions. Um, so the next one is managing debt and saving money. Um, so if you have debt, it's critically, critically important that you create a plan for paying it off as quickly as possible. So that the goal is that you can free up more money for savings and other financial goals. So as you read these books, the Dave Ramsey's of the world compared to the Robert Kawasaki's, Dave is like, live a debt-free life, even your house. You want zero dollars. Robert on the other side is create cash flowing assets and by doing that, use other people's money, which is debt. Uh, so it's very, very two different perspectives. We're kind of in the, I'm personally in the middle a little bit, um, is that I think that debt is okay, provided that it's healthy debt. Um, I think that your college education is healthy debt. I think that your house is healthy debt. I don't think that a Lamborghini is healthy debt. Um, but I do think that like a Toyota is healthy debt if you don't have a car, but that may be a scooter in the beginning for you. Um, so another thing related to debt is what percentage interest that you're paying for it. And this is going to vary on what country that you live in. If you're in the U.S., you can get a car loan for 4%. Um, so I love that. That's phenomenal. Get the car loan. And you can pay it over a long period of time. And provided that your finances, your income can support whatever that debt is, then it makes sense that you would pay debt for your transportation. The car loans that I don't like are the ones that are 19%. Um, that you're paying an enormous amount of interest on it over a short period of time, so you're choking yourself for a season. Um, but I know sometimes in your life, you might have to do that. Say you move to a country that you, you don't have the ability to get credit. Um, so you may say when you look at your budget, all right, we're not going to go out to eat because we have this achy car loan because of these circumstances that are beyond our control and we have to get to work. Um, so... And then the other side is house debt, is that especially as you look at your house debt, and most of the time um, when you're purchasing a property or you're building a property or something like that, is that your option is to pay that money to rent to a landlord, which the future is that you guys would want to be the landlords, is paying that money to somebody else, which it just disappears and goes away. That's the equivalent of leasing a car, or it becomes an asset. So at least that money that you're paying the $1,500 in rent that you're paying, the $2,000 in rent that you're paying is going towards your asset that eventually you're going to own one day. Um, so paying off for that is the first thing. And then really being intentional about your spending habits and find ways to cut back on teeny tiny little expenses that could make a big difference. Um, there's a couple great movies that are out there that I didn't refer to. Sorry, my nose keeps running. <laughs> um, there's some really good movies that will motivate you in your spending. Um, one is called Minimalism. It's on Netflix. If you guys haven't uh, watched it, please make sure to watch it because it talks about the environmental impact. Oh, sorry. It talks about, they do research around stuff that it's this era of people that are living this minimalistic lifestyle. And um, they, I think the statistic was that when they do this, when they study, you actually only need 33 pieces of apparel or clothing. That includes socks, shoes, jewelry. They, you might have a closet stuff full, full of stuff, but you really only like about 33 of those pieces. And so when you look at your spending and when you look at what you're spending money on, whatever that thing may be for you, be it from coffee to a... Um, a piece of clothing is that, and I just listened to something the other day that there, it, the, the gentleman was saying that anytime you have a desire for something, it's actually because of something that's lacking inside of you. So ask, you know, if I'm going, all right, I'm going to Vegas, I want a new dress. I have to start unpacking why I want that new dress. What is, what is that thing that I'm telling myself? 
is the truth or the core of the wanting the new dress and be is that maybe as I unpack it is that I have nothing to wear. I have nothing in my closet. I have gained weight, so I don't fit into any of my dress. Gaining weight makes me unattractive. When I'm unattractive, I'm undesirable. Blah, 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 blah. And you start to figure out what the core is of that wanting the dress. And so every time you have a desire for something, just unpack it. Just go through that exercise because we go for this impulsivity. We go through, hey, I want this thing. But when you're coming off of a ship and money is really important, managing your money is really important to you, um, it's, it's critical that you're asking those questions because that $100, $200 you spend on a dress, that could be something that you're putting into a savings account, that you're putting into an investment that's going to grow longer term for you. Um, and those things start to add up very, very quickly. Or it could go to paying down your debt. Uh, so don't be strong in asking those difficult questions to yourself. Having faith in what your future can be is that when you start asking questions about your spending and going, why really am I doing this? Why do I like going out to dinner? Why do I like going and having drinks after work? What are the things? How could I do it in a better, more efficient way? And when you start poking holes in it, maybe it means having people over to your apartment and getting two bottles of wine versus going to a place to do it. But maybe you allow yourself once a, once a month the ability to go to the place. So that's just simple examples. Um, next is dealing with the unexpected. One of the things, having debt, not having full visibility to your money is that when something happens, it can spin you out of control. And I think every single person that's listening can raise their hand and go, yep, I've had that experience. And we never want to be in that position. But we get in that position when we are not saving enough and when we're spending in a way that doesn't require us to be accountable. So no matter how well you plan, you're going to have unexpected expenses. They're bound to come up. It could be a surprise tax bill. It could be that your a pipe breaks in your home or your apartment. This is why it's so, so important to have an emergency fund in place to cover these expenses. And if you look at your budget and you break it down after you guys do that first exercise of writing down every single thing that you're spending money on, then every single thing you want to spend money on. The next thing is that, do I have enough money left over to put into an emergency fund? The numbers are all over the board, but you should have a minimum three to six months worth of your expenses in an emergency fund. So as you do that expense layout, say that you are you make $1,500 a month, and let's say that 1,000 of those or 1,200 of those are expenses, and then you have 300 left over. Is that 300 knowing how you are going to put it aside. If you have no emergency fund, if you have zero in your emergency fund, you are going to tighten up your bootstraps and you're going to go, I'm not going to spend on anything silly for the next six months so that I can get a minimum of three to six months of savings. I would really like to see everybody at six months. So that means, should you lose your job? Should you get sick? Should something happen drastically that you need to stop working, you know you have enough money for six months to cover your living expenses. So by just doing that disciplined behavior on the front end and just tightening it up, tightening up your budget for a couple months, that can give you this tremendous amount of security that when something happens, most people have to then rely on credit cards. They have to go into debt. And when you do that, you're looking at going in and paying above a 20% interest rate for a very long time just to keep your head above water. And what gets really dangerous is that when you don't have this emergency fund, and I'm sorry to give you guys doom and gloom, but I feel like this is an important side of the story, is that when you do not have an emergency fund of three to six months, then if you get into a situation where you can't work or you have some issue that you have some extraordinary expense is that you end up putting that on credit cards and if you can't pay your rent you have to do a cash advance on a credit card which is even worse so i would just encourage you all that start with three months work towards that tighten your bootstraps for a little bit and get that three months 
And then you're going to start getting moment, momentum and excitement and then put it to six months. And there's um, a really great book that I've read that for our business finance. It's called Profit First. And one of the strategies that I think is something that you can layer onto your personal life, one of the things that he does is that he has multiple bank accounts for your business. And there's two bank accounts, which um, depending on what country you're in, um, if you're doing independent contractor work, then you need the tax one. If you're not, if your employer pays your taxes, um, then you don't need it. Um, but one is a tax account and one is essentially a savings account. And one of the things that he does is he opens these bank accounts in a bank where he can't see the money. He just does automatic transfers from his. So say your paycheck comes into this bank account and you're automatically moving 10% into that account and 10% to that account. And I know there's a lot of different platforms out there, but the key is not giving yourself access to the money unless it's a real true emergency. So I like that. Um, Gosh, what's his last name? Mike Michalowicz, I think is his last name. Mike Michalowicz, he's got a couple really good books. Um, is I like that idea of whatever that amount of money that you're going to start, if be at $100 a month, that you're going to start off saving, it be at $50 a month. I don't care. It's just the habit of doing the exercise of going and putting it away into some place that you can't touch it and then allowing it to grow. And then eventually there's something, and Mike's, Mike's philosophy behind it is that he looks at it every three months. And then his, um, so let's say that you guys get to a place where you're still in that habit of saving 10%, 20%, whatever it may be, into your savings account. And then you say, all right, I want, my goal is to have a six month emergency fund. You get the six month emergency fund built up. You go and check your account and you go, wow, I have more. I could do a vacation. And then you allow yourself every three minutes to make a decision around that money and go on a vacation or buy a, the dress that you wanted or buy a pair of shoes or um, invite your friends out to dinner and you pay. Uh, so start thinking about what that habit can create with you and not think of it as sacrifice, but think of it as something that's building. Um, so next one is planning for the future. So when it comes to planning for the future, um, I really want you to work hard to set specific financial goals. And this allows this budgeting process, which seems and feels restrictive and not fun, exciting. So I use post-it notes. Everybody laughs at me, but they they do steal my trick. Is I have post-it notes and my my teams and when I work for cruise lines is that whenever I would get to like crazy person mode, then the post-it notes would come out because I would have a D idea, put it on a post-it note, put it on the wall. Another one, put it on a post-it note, put it on a wall. And then I would take, when I completed it, I would put it into this other area and I got to see like this whole pool of all the post-it notes. So I do that in my personal life. And I do it, and I would give it to you guys in a, as an exercise. If you're not doing, maybe it's a list, you do whatever works for you, but mine happens to be post-it notes. And I have, um, so the, uh, so I was just going to say, is use the power of these notes. And the thing for me is that because I look at it every single day and some stuff, I would say maybe 5% of them, I just go, okay, I don't want that anymore. That was like some, some crazy, some crazy dream that I had. And uh, I don't want that Airbnb in Mexico. So I'm going to take it off. But the ones that I do achieve, then I put them inside of my closet so that I see it. I have like a little vanity. I put it inside of my closet and then I'm able to go, yeah. That's good. By me being smart in this area of my life, by managing my finances and my money well and have very specific goals, then I'm able to get excited and achieve so much more. I can be like, I want to be able to go out to dinner once a month with my partner to a nice dinner. And that may be your goal. And then all of a sudden, when you get to look at that on your mirror, on your wall in your bedroom every single day and see that, and then you go, oh, wait, Look at, we achieved it. And then you move it to the other side of your of your room. And then you get to see and you get to write new things and nothing becomes out of your reach. So I would just encourage you that as you start thinking about the future, the future is not just retirement. It's also, you know, next year, next month, a vacation you want to take with your family. Make sure that you're setting specific goals and then create a plan to achieve them. So you're going, all right. If I want to get this, I want to go on a vacation with my family. 
that would equate to saving $50 a month or $100 a month for the next whatever the period may be. I want to get a better car. All right. If, if, and, and some of the things that, you know, we would do early, early on in, in our relationship is that we would, we had our set budget. And then all of a sudden the prices, at least in the U.S., the prices of gas fluctuate so much, um, is that the prices of gas went up. So, our our monthly budget for gas was $100 and all of a sudden it's $125. So we have to take that $25 from somewhere else. All right, can we cut on groceries a little bit? Can we buy the generic stuff and the brand name stuff? Uh, can we call the insurance company and negotiate our insurance? How about the internet company? How about our cell phone company? Can I move to my mom's plan so that I get a better rate? Can I talk to my company? There's so many creative ways to prevent us from mindlessly spending money by negotiating, by asking for the discount, by cutting coupons, um, by going out to dinner on the night when it's, you know, ladies night and drinks are free. Um, so I think that there's so, so, so many things that you can do. Um, and then eventually this savings, in you get to create what you desire, but then your next level of this, once you have your emergency fund, once you have your budget totally buttoned up, and you're starting to build that list of the desires that you want, then you're starting saving for your retirement. So it might be saving for your retirement depending on what country that you're in and if you need to. It might be paying off your mortgage. It might be investing in stocks or real estate. Um, it might be getting life insurance or creating a long-term plan for yourself in, in case of illness or disability. So those types of things, when you all of a sudden, you got your emergency fund in place, you know how much you're spending on everything. You get to be able to have some dreams and desires that motivate you as part of your savings. Emergency fund is in there. Then that emergency fund money becomes dreams and desires. Then the next thing is investment. So you, you don't feel, I do not think anybody should be investing in anything if you're in debt. That's just me. And I don't mean house debt. I mean bad debt. So if you are negative every single month, you shouldn't be going out there and looking at stocks. You shouldn't be trying to find the next best thing. I, a lot of people go, oh, well, I'm going to invest in the stock market and their dad and their whoever says, oh, that's a great idea. But the stock market is still gambling. It's not any different than going to Las Vegas and, you know, putting money on the blackjack table. Unless you have the experience in investment and the truth of the matter is if you listen to people like Warren Buffett, other investment, Ray Dalio is a really great one. They tell you the thing that really truly performs is standard S&P 500, Dow Jones, things like that. Look over time what performance of stocks are for long-term healthy growth instead of looking for what's the next best solar panel or the Teslas or the Apple. Sure, the stories make the news of all these people that made money fast, but you are in the business of long-term healthy growth. That's what I would desire for you. Um, so last but not least, um, this is a huge, huge, huge topic that, as you can see, I could talk for hours about. Um, it's really, really important that you start, you ask for help. If you don't feel like you have your head around your finances, please do not go to a financial planner. Go to somebody who you respect, who has their stuff in order, that they manage their budget as a family, they have small investments, they have money and savings, and say, tell me about your journey. Tell me what you do. What are the tactics that you use? And then ask that person to walk alongside you and support you. And then next is stay in community. There's so many groups that are out there um, from Facebook groups to, um, if you guys, I don't know if you've heard of Clubhouse, it's another social media platform. Start listening, start being surrounded by people who read these books, who care about making their lot, their financial life stronger, and they educate themselves to do it. And then stay in community with each other. So if you have seen to master this and you know somebody else that's getting off a ship, ask this question. Just say, hey, you're getting off a ship. Are you prepared financially? Like, have you worked on a budget? Have you, is there any way that I could support you? I feel like this is something that I've done really, really well. Um, so please let me know. You're not giving financial advice. You're just sharing what are, and that's what today is. I'm just sharing, hey, this is how I educated myself. This is what we've done that has worked for us. And then I think grow together. 
um, that there's an old saying, if you're not growing, you're dying. Um, I believe in it uh, because I, I'm super, super conscious about not wasting one second of my day. And it drives my husband bonkers because I never want to have superficial conversations. I want to make sure that I'm learning, that I'm growing, that I am. Um, and I schedule you. I told you guys about my scheduling is that when I'm getting ready in the morning, if I'm blow drying my hair or if I'm putting on makeup, I'm listening to something. I'm listening to something that's educating me, that's helping me learn to figure out what that is in the financial world. Do you want to learn about Airbnb rentals? Do you want to learn about buying multifamily investments? Do you want to learn about the stock market? Do you want to learn about budgeting 101? Start feeding your brain with that instead of coming up with excuses as to why you're not good at it. The worst excuse I've ever heard on the planet, and I despise it, is all oh, my teachers and my parents didn't teach us that. What? Like, don't rely on other people to educate you on the money that you're earning and you're making. Um, be really, really conscientious about how you're educating yourself and what your strategy is going to be. So as somebody who's been through that the transition from ship to shore, I know firsthand how challenging it can be. And I believe that with the right tools and the support, you can absolutely thrive in this next chapter of your life. So just know that we're committed to supporting you guys, myself, Christian Wilhelmina and our what will be our growing team is if you need help guidance if you have questions please just reach out to us it, has, it doesn't have to be job placement related if it's like hey Barbara I'm struggling in this area hey Christian I'm struggling in this area could you give me a 15 minute call a 30 minute call we would be more than happy to because our goal is the overall wellness of former crew is that giving you guys tools so that you can confidently walk off a gangway or confidently interview or confidently post on LinkedIn and um, feel that you're honoring yourself and representing yourself in the right way. So as you embark on this new journey, just, just remember that you're not alone in any of this. Um, we're here to help you navigate challenges. Um, and really, we believe in what your future success could be financially, but we're going to push you to do the planning and do, do the work to make sure that you have long-term success on land. So thank you guys for, for listening, for staying on the call. Are there any questions or anything that is crying for anybody that, that we can help you with? Yeah, Colleen, go ahead. Sure. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a comment um, about uh, making major life decisions and doing yeah. research for it, if I could. Yeah. yeah. Um, over the last several years, I have been fundraising for three friends who um, bought homes. And coincidentally, they had the same home inspector and they went into debt into tens of thousands of dollars wow yes and uh, i'll always tell people um because i've learned through my friends if they're going to buy a home because you know maybe um they were in a situation where they had saved so much money because of the success that they had in their work and now they were ready to make a big down payment and they were looking at a very small mortgage and unfortunately they were set back so far by making um, a decision with a home inspector and what i would say to people is when you get off ships and if you can uh, build a team of people that you really trust uh, to yeah. guide you and you can do the research you talked about not doing things with your eyes closed yeah. um, uh, they had trusted uh, their um, real estate agent the home inspector had been um, recommended by the same company and this actual home inspector had been the subject of uh, an investigation because wow. of their past practices so wow. um, I've been fundraising for them we've got a lawyer to uh, work for them pro bono because they're going to sue this home inspector but it wow. devastated them mentally and financially and yeah. um, I think when you go and you say you buy a home, this may be jumping well ahead of what you were talking about. Yeah. The, the thing to do is ask your lawyer, if the home inspector was terrible, who would be investigating that home inspector? Yeah. It's another home inspector that they would appoint. That's the person who should be doing your home inspection in the first place. 
Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And, and I think, Michelle, your point is, thank you for doing that. I think it, what a great friend you are and what a good advocate you are. And I think that the depth of what you're, you're describing is you can feel so stupid after something like that happens to you and fraud or deception or you're just being trustworthy. And I think it, once you get off the ship, you tend to trust people. I think that as I find that as you feel confident and you get full control over your money and how you spend it, you're incredibly protective of who you allow into it. You you have to be intuitive. You have to follow your gut. And and I'll give you like uh, the Tony Robbins money book is also a really great book. I don't know why, but I didn't put it on here. Um, but the, one of the things that a lot of this goes back to is educating yourself. If you don't understand debt, if you don't understand cash flow, if you don't understand budgeting, if you don't understand negotiation, then when you walk into these situations, you're not going to see the red flags. You're not going to know the questions to ask. And so providing yourself a fundamental foundation on money as a whole, and I'll, the greatest analogy that I can give as financial advisors is we get financial advisors that come to us all the time that want to talk to us or give us advice, and, blah, 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 and they want you to spill all your financial information. My first question to them is, what's your personal financial strategy? What do you do with your money and where do you put it? And they're so shocked by that question, they don't know how to answer it. The good ones do. The majority of them struggle because they don't have a strategy. And I'm like, so do you expect me to trust you as a real estate agent, as a financial advisor, as whatever that may be, but you can't clearly communicate to me what your personal strategy is with your money? No, 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 that's not happening. So I think that education is advocacy. So thanks for that, Michelle. That's a great, great point. Anybody else? Right, go ahead, Michelle. No, the last thing I wanted to say was if they had researched a little further, if they had yeah. Googled this home inspector's name, they would have found that article that was, well, it was yeah. CBC, which is the national uh, station here in Canada. They would have uh, found the written article. They would have seen the interviews on TV. But because they had just just dug yeah. a little bit, but not deep enough, they had that experience. Yeah. So the reason, thank you for letting me talk. The reason why I'm uh, expressing this now is I would never want to see anybody else go through this yeah. just because what a number it does on people's mental health and their financial yeah. health and then eventually their physical health having to deal with that situation yeah. when you come from a background uh on cruise lines you root for everyone don't you you want yep. so much for everybody you've ever worked with and that's the mentality and unfortunately on land uh you don't have that uh, same support system it's very yeah. um uh, self-centered <laughs> I, I couldn't say that uh it's uh, no 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 you know, I understand. we understand not everyone yeah. has your back so the reason why i'm sharing this story is i would never want to see anybody else go through what my friends went through yeah yeah that's a great point that's a great point thanks for sharing that it'll hopefully protect somebody out there any other questions or comments as we wrap up the week no. Well, thank you guys. Uh, like I say every week, thank you for investing in yourself. Um, thank you for showing up for yourself. Thank you for participating. Please make sure to go on YouTube if you missed any of our weeks. And um, again, from the ship to shore side, please make sure to update your profile, check out any new job postings, and also communicate back to us. Um, if there's something you guys don't like about our email communication, if there's something that you would prefer to have on the webinars, or there's something that you're finding wonky in our platform that's hard to navigate, please tell us. You guys are our foundational crew that are getting us started. And um, the only way we get better is by getting feedback. So please, 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 I welcome it. Um, but thank you guys. Have a wonderful week. And um, get your head around that money. You got it.